Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here. Glad to be with you and hope you are glad to be with me. Got a lot to cover on this edition of the program. So take out your notebook, your pen, your paper, or however else you make notes. Uh, Pete Fisher of the Dog Truck Company will be joining us. Uh, number one, to talk about some of the new stuff that they got. And number two, to answer a lot of our questions about dog training, especially as we are getting closer and closer to hunting season. Some of the things we probably should not neglect this time of year. So stick around for that. We'll also have your two cents worth. I'm asking this week, will you be using a new shotgun this season? Interesting replies of all sorts, so you'll enjoy that. And we'll be going to a spot in Missouri on our public access road trip. So join me, join everybody else who uh, enjoys talking about bird dogs, bird hunting, and uh, shotguns. It's all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast. Made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and welcome, True Lock Choke Tubes. Well, if you are in the Midwest, uh, I guess I'll call it the lower Midwest, uh, then you probably know what a great program they have in Missouri. They take a little slice of a little sales tax and devote it to conservation. One of the beneficiaries is the Emmett and Leah Seat Memorial Conservation Area. That's in northwest Missouri. Incredible public Bob White quail habitat, a mix of prairie, crops, timber, heavy brush, big and small patches. Now look out during the deer season. It's extremely popular because it's only about 100 miles north of Kansas City. It's also about 100 miles south of Des Moines. But once you get to that country and quail season starts and deer season ends, there is lots of opportunity for you Bob White hunters. It's all taking place at the Emmett and Leah Seat Memorial Conservation Area in Northwest Missouri. Check it out. And then check out midvalleyclays.com. Since Tom and I took our lessons, we've been practicing every day. I've got a little gizmo set up with an oscillating fan and a flashlight so I can practice my move mount shoot on moving targets. Yeah, that flashlight beam on the wall in the ceiling. And it seems to be helping. Thanks again, Vandy Fiedler from Mid Valley Clays. Dot com. The shooting school there has over a dozen instructors. No matter what your fancy, if you're a hunter, a youth, a woman, or a competitive target shooter, they got somebody who specializes in exactly what you want to learn at Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School. Take a lesson, then practice. Learn more about them at midvalleyclays.com. And once you're a better shooter, come on down to Huron, South Dakota, Ringneck Nation. Get a free information packet at hunthuronsd.com. Just scroll down, then you'll click on that. You'll give them your mailing address, and they'll send you a big package of stuff. Everything from maps to discounts, all the public access is marked for you on the maps. Plenty of information of various sorts. I'll be there this year, and maybe you will too. Hunt huronsd.com Nice to talk with him on the phone instead of fleetingly at an event like Pheasant Fest. Uh, Pete Fisher joins me. He's a senior consultant for Dogtra. You know the Dogtra folks, collars, etc., etc. In fact, I was just gifted three more of your remote launchers, Pete. So um, uh, thank you, Ben. It's one way to remember you in the future. So thank you very much. Pete Fisher, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thanks for having me, Scott. I appreciate it. And so how you been? (laughs) I'm good. I'm good. I I think the last time that you and I talked, 
It was over a cold adult beverage at Pheasant Fest. In oh, my Pau, God. Uh, in Minneapolis, in uh, pr- just right before the pandemic hit. Scott. Yeah, in um, fact. I think that is the last um, time I, I talked to you, we, and we, we sat for quite a while visiting. Yep. So. We did, and you had at least one and maybe two sons with you, and that's about, yeah, I, I can't believe I remember family. that much, considering yeah. how many adult beverages we had that night. <laughs> <laughs> if memory serves me, yes, my youngest son, Brett, yeah. uh, who was uh, just out of college and had his first big boy job, came down and worked with me um, Brett met us that that night and worked yeah. uh, during the day, and then we we hung out and had a drink and and something to eat. And then I actually had my older son Nate come down uh, the following day, and we were extremely busy. We our booth looked uh, was just we got bombarded. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that's kind of my home home court, so to speak. You know, after yeah. writing for Pheasants Forever magazine for years and being involved as a uh, as a life member and a 35 40 year sponsor of pheasants wow. forever yeah. um you know it's I, i've got a lot of roots in the pheasants forever organization oh and you know i i look at it as almost a high school reunion you know you show up there and you see guys yeah. like you who you never see anywhere yeah. else and uh and you got to get caught up and uh, and so we do and and that's a good one because you know it's the only event i, t- I tell a lot of people the same thing it's the only event where everybody in the room is kind of like you and that that's a good yeah. thing you know yeah mm-hmm. uh, uh, and, and go ahead yeah, well in a fair amount of them have dogs i mean let's face it yeah, uh, if, yeah. if you don't have a dog and you're a pheasant hunter you really all you're doing is just out for a walk yeah so um so we all have you know that common theme so to speak we love to hunt pheasants and we have a dog and and we love to uh, spend a day in the in the uh, chase in the ring neck so and and I think Scott, if I, uh, I my memory is not all that great, uh, was the next Pheasant Fest canceled, and then this yeah. past year uh, we did not go. Pheasants yeah. Forever did not go, uh, or excuse me, Doctor did not go to Pheasant Fest. Yeah. Uh, we had a number of our people got sick, and um, so. But hopefully, if if all things go well, we will will be at Pheasant Fest, which is back in Minneapolis. Looking uh, forward to in, it. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I got a new book to sign, and who knows what else I'll be doing there. So it oh, should be a, a good time. Guy. Yeah. So a- anyway, the upshot of all of that is, hey, if you're anywhere near Minneapolis, go to Pheasant Fest. It's a lot of fun. You'll you'll see people. Yeah. I mean, everybody who everybody's byline that you recognize in a magazine, they're there, and and. Mm-hmm. Uh, to a person they're great people and 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 then you can ask all these technical questions like i'm going to ask of pete fisher of dogtra so (laughs) you can get all of that in more and then you know if you don't have a plastic bag bulging at the at the plastic seams with stuff to take home and study well you're just not doing your job so uh, bring yourself a hand cart or a wheelbarrow and fill it up with all the literature and and learn something as well um mm-hmm. oh okay so um you know i'll send my invoice to pheasants forever for their commercial just now but uh <laughs> it, let's let's do a commercial for dogtra what's new at dogtra.com and beyond well we have a, a couple uh new products that just came out and, and i think one of them is actually sold out and they are uh, waiting for another shipment to come in is our Pathfinder unit has been extremely popular. Oh what yeah, that is Scott. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a GPS e collar combination that actually runs on an app on your phone, and um, and we updated it, and the new one is called Pathfinder Two, and that has been a, a very popular uh, product for us. And and the reason being is that uh, most people already have some form of smartphone, mm-hmm. and so the, the pricing when you compare it to a full-blown GPS unit, which has its own separate handheld, uh, is it's about half the price. And so that unit's been very popular, and we came out with a, a updated version. And then, unfortunately, uh, this is the way technology works, is that uh, you know the old system is not compatible with the new one. Uh, the old system isn't going away. We still update the app for it. But the new system is not compatible because of the technology that's in the new one. I believe and, um, Yeah, and that's just the way things work. Some people don't understand that. Most people uh, get it, and if they want to update, they, they sell their existing product and, and buy the latest and greatest. But that's, that's one thing that has been uh, uh, just came out within the last couple of months. Great. And now we also make a number of remote training callers, Scott, 
Uh, I don't know if you've seen these or not, but we call it the hands-free, but it has this little hands-free transmitter that's about the size of your watch that uh, is synced to your main transmitter. So you could have your transmitter in your pocket and you could strap this um, hands-free device, almost like a little kicker button, that, and you can implement the stimulation. You could strap it around your stock of your gun, around your wrist, um, anything like that. But it's, it works, works off it. a technology very similar to Bluetooth, mm -hmm. so that main transmitter still has to be within about 25 feet of this small hands-free device. But uh, those have been very popular. Uh, a lot of pet dog people like it because they – are able to put the uh, main transmitter in their pocket and they just have the hands-free uh, transmitter strapped around their wrist and uh, they take the dog out for a walk in suburbia. What a great idea. And, you know, for mm -hmm. both of those, even the um, the Pathfinder, and I need to get back to that in a moment, you know, it's like, why didn't anybody think of this before? You know, and, you know, thank goodness there are people out there at Dogdra and other places where, that are coming along with this kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. On the on the on the Pathfinder, what what was what is the gist of the update you did on that? Uh, the update, the the main piece of the update is on the Pathfinder. You have the collar itself, which goes on the dog, and then you have this additional piece that's called a connecting device. Yeah, and a lot of people don't understand what that is, but that basically syncs your MERS band radio signal, your long range radio signal, which is MERS band, and it syncs your GPS signal. And that actually brings that via Bluetooth signal up to your phone. What we did with the original Pathfinder, that is all that connecting device did. It actually looks like a might look like a transmitter for a remote training caller. Yeah. But yeah. that piece of equipment, the connecting device, syncs all the signal up to your phone and relays it back and forth. Now with the Pathfinder 2, that particular unit you can actually implement the stimulation off of the connecting device scott ah. so you could have the phone in your pocket and this could be hanging around your neck and you and i are upland hunting uh you look down let's say at your phone you see the dog is pushing gun range uh you just grab that connecting device and and you can implement your stimulation to bring them back in right. and keep them under control so you whereas in the past you had to do it all through the app on your phone open up you know your phone get the app would be up and running and then you would implement it there you can still do that but your connecting device now has the ability to implement the stimulation love it yeah just one, so, one we had a lot headache. of people wanted that yeah, yeah a lot of people wanted that in it and so that is so when you when you think about it what i said earlier people some people said well geez you know i bought the the first pathfinder version and now here you got pathfinder 2 and it doesn't it doesn't sync together well the technology's been updated and it's just uh, what i would say is it's like comparing apples to pancakes it's just it can't connect so um so yeah so that's one of great. our uh, that's probably great. the biggest feature change in the pathfinder great uh, i love it and uh, of course if you want to learn all about all that stuff go to dogtra.com d-o-g-t-r-a dot Calm. Are you guys uh, uh, getting through all the supply chain issues? To, uh, I know you just mentioned that the new Pathfinder is kind of sold out, but um, in general, have have you kind of worked around most of the other challenges there? No, we have not. Not at all. Well, welcome to the club. Nope. Nobody yeah, has. It is. It's scary. It, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle. And um, we have uh, orders uh, backlog that we we, we can't fulfill. And a lot of it, you know, you hear every day on the news, um, the business channels, the chip shortage, it, it's real. It's, it's real in that we don't, um, we're like a lot of companies. Uh, we don't make all the chips. We yeah. don't make the chip ourselves. Yeah. We have them under patent and, a, and another company makes them for us. Um, probably in Seoul, Korea, where we're based out of. Uh, not in China. Ours is not a Chinese-made product. I always have to tell people that. Mm -hmm. And we own our own factories. Interestingly enough, Scott, before the pandemic hit, uh, in the, the the pandemic did it hit? Was that the the spring or late winter of 2020? Sounds about was right. The, yeah. Yeah. So in December of 2019, uh, the owners uh, of Dogtra put me on a plane and flew my wife and I over to the headquarters in Seoul. And I spent a week there touring the factory and uh, spending time over there. And that was really interesting. And, and one of the, the reason I, I say that, brought that up is 
One of the reasons that we have such a doctor has such a very low breakage rate is that we own our own factories. We don't <sighs> contract out with a different factory to, that might be making baby monitors one month and now the next week training collars. Wow. We own our own factories. So the chips uh, that that we have, we don't necessarily make them. Yeah. They're sourced to a, a, as per our uh, specs and under our patent, and they're made by a chip company, shipped back to us and installed into the units in Seoul, and then they're brought over here to, to California. So uh, the chip shortage is real. We've struggled with that. Uh, I assume probably some of the chips, Scott, to be honest with you, are probably made in, uh, that we use are made in Taiwan also. Yeah. And so... Uh, we have uh, we've struggled, but we're 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 uh, we're doing okay. We've had great years. You know, everybody went and got a dog uh, mm-hmm, when they were mm-hmm. when they were at home yep. during the pandemic, and and so we had some awfully good years uh, uh, because of that. But things are still good, but we have been slowed down because of the the whole supply. And the other thing is, uh, based on where we're at in in uh, California. Garden Grove is where they're at now. So we're not far from the port of Long Beach. Yeah. And we have times, Scott, we, there's containers of, of product there and we can't get them. There's yep. nobody there to unload the ships. It, it's, uh, it's for sure a problem. So, Well, so the lesson in all of that is just like your ammo and your shotguns and even your boots, uh, when it becomes available, jump on it and uh, – mm-hmm and take advantage of its availability. By the way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm the host, Scott Linden. That's Pete Fisher. He's with Dogtra, senior consultant, and he he knows his way around a few of those handheld devices of various sort. Pete, uh, what else do you do for Dogtra in that regard? Are you kind of, you know, I, I joke about it in almost every industry, but what we need advocates like you going to the factory and saying, why don't you do this instead? I mean, do you get involved in that kind of thing? Uh, very much so. Um, so a couple of things, Scott. I, I actually work as a private contractor. Uh-huh. Uh, I am not an actual employee of the company. And how did I become that? So I was in the retriever training business for 30-some years and, and had a fairly large retriever training kennel called Fisher's Kennels and Hunt Club up here in central Minnesota. And I had used uh, Tritronics for many years, like a lot of professional trainers had. And then Dogtra came on the scene back in the uh, early 90s and um, uh, mid 90s. And I started using some of their product and really liked it and made a connection with them. And so it was the product that I used for years, Scott, while I was in business. Yeah. And consequently got to know the owners of the company, started doing some work for them, Scott. Even when you would see me at uh, the SHOT Show uh Back in the day uh, when I still had my business, I yeah. was doing contract work for them back, for Dogtra back then, Sure. even though I had my own business. I had the opportunity to sell my business, and I had uh, sold off some of the property we own also. I had 360 acres here at one time and uh, had an opportunity to go to work for Dogtra, and, and so I did that in the year 2009. And so I do some of everything. I got introduced here a couple of years ago at a rep group uh training session and the um, the owner of the company introduced me pete fisher with the dog Tree company pete's like the swiss army knife for dog Tree. he can do some <laughs> of everything so uh i guess the you know the term uh uh, uh jack of all trade yeah, master yeah. of none might be very fitting but i do some of everything so i i do uh i work for the owners of the company and there's two owners and um, that's that's who I answer to, so to speak. But I do some of everything for them. Uh, almost all of the product that gets introduced, I'm going to be one of the first ones to test it. I do get my fingers involved with helping relay information, giving them feedback on features, functions, things of that nature on what we should be uh, designing. Uh, and we listen to people that use their product. Uh, and a lot of that nowadays, Scott, comes through social media. Sure. So, a lot of people don't know this, but I monitor uh, the Dogtra social media pages almost all the time. I've got them open, and, and many times people don't know who that is behind the curtain answering <laughs> the technical questions, uh, but that's me. And uh, I do a lot of that for the company. Even on weekends, I've, I'm checking on it So because we don't have customer service like many yeah. companies on, on weekends or, or nights. So that's one of the other things that I do for the company, and we get a lot of feedback, Scott, through oh, the, through our social media, and and we I relay that to our 
owners into the R&D. Well, let's talk about that for just a moment, and then we'll get on to the more important stuff, dogs and bird hunting. But uh, um, while we have a chance to talk to one of the guys at Dogter who actually has input and knows how to work this stuff, what is one of the biggest questions you get on social media about the products in the company? Well, one of the most common uh, questions we get nowadays is the pandemic got many, many people working from home. Yeah. And many went out and got dogs and many went out and thought, you know what? My dog looks really nice and I can take pictures with my fancy iPhone and I can be a Instagram uh, expert collaborator. Yeah. Uh, Scott, if we don't, if I don't see three or four um, messages a day into our social media accounts. Hey, would you like to collaborate with me? Uh. I've got a, I've got, you know, and, and most of them, Scott, the vast majority of them are pet dog people. Yeah. And, uh, and they, they want to do something with us for some kind of money or kickback. That's probably the most common thing I see. Wow. Uh, because uh, we've like a lot of companies have, have been just inundated in many different ways uh, with with business, we struggle at times to get all of the emails answered, phone calls returned, and consequently, Scott, people come on social media and they will ask, what unit is right for my dog? Sure. And then I start corresponding with them, private messaging them, tell me about your dog, what's the breed of dog, what's the size of the dog, has the dog been on a remote training caller before? And I assist them that way. Uh, there's times when people have problems with their unit. Let's face it, electronics break. Uh, people use the most common issue that I run into on social media is people have started using the wrong charger on a unit. Ooh. And and they, yes, and it happens. If it doesn't happen almost daily, and some of them get upset, you know, God, I bought this unit, and I got here I am one year into it, it doesn't hold a charge, and then I say to them, please send me a photo of the charger you're using they might have multiple dog tree units mm. and now they've taken oh. a 10 volt system and started using a 5 volt charger on it or they've just picked some random charger out of the drawer that god only knows where it came from doesn't even have the dog tree logo on it scott yeah and they started using that and then and they wonder why it's not charging so many many times uh in those situations it's operator error oh yeah so that that is probably the most common issue when we do deal with something that becomes a, a legitimate uh, product failure, then I turn them over to customer service. I also manage a fairly large, what we call our field staff. They're mm -hmm. professional trainers in all walks of life around the country that I've got to know, and we probably got close to 200 of them. When those individuals uh, have problems with their units and legitimate problems or <laughs> using the wrong charger problems, Many times they reach out directly to Pete and, and I take care of it for him rather than going through customer service. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more about that because I, I, you know, I just, I remember again talking with somebody recently and, and they said, well, you know, uh, you know, on a GPS collar, the, the, um, the little black box needs to be up on the top so it can reach the satellite signal and vice versa. What other simple forehead slapping advice would you have for somebody whether it's an e-call or a training caller or a gps call anything else what are what are one of those things that we just we're probably doing wrong well uh, a common problem that i see is individuals that it all works on on the e-callers they all work on fm yeah. radio signal okay yeah and so basically that's line of sight mm -hmm. and so if you've got your transmitter inside your hunting vest and you're pushing the buttons to reinforce a command on your dog let's say he's uh, the dog's too far up front or whatever it may be and the dog isn't complying and you say well geez the unit must not be working it's probably because you've got your hand on the antenna the transmitters up against your body any of that will affect your range of your unit and so if you looked in an owner's manual we we have a little stick man drawing that shows you know down at your belt is okay up at your chest is better hand over your head with the transmitter is where you, when you've got a dog that's a long ways out, that's going to get you your best signal. Yeah. So, so people don't always understand that, that, that the technology is there, but it's not that sophisticated that uh, it's like uh, having your car radio playing and you go under a bridge uh, or a tunnel. 
you know, it's going to disrupt your, your signal. And that holds true with GPS. You know, if you're in the grouse woods and you've got early season hunting, Scott, and you've got a lot of foliage on the trees, uh-huh. Uh-huh. well, th- think about you having your Google map opened up and you're in a parking garage. Uh, it's going to wait. You know, the, the GPS is not going to connect until you get out. And so you get an open view to the sky, so to speak. So yeah. those are some of the things that we run into on a regular basis Yep. Um, that, that people just think that the technology should always work, and it still has some limitations because it's technology. Well, I'll never forget, I had a uh, prototype unit from Garmin back in the day. It was just a handheld GPS before they even took over Tritronics. And mm-hmm. I was I was field testing it out near Winnemucca, Nevada, in a pouring mm-hmm. rain. I mean, uh, a toad-drowning, gully-washing rain I'd never experienced. I had to dig myself out of the mud twice on that trip. <laughs> anyway, so I'm, I said, I asked the GPS, where's my truck? And it says, oh, it's right over there. So I walk that way, and I'm looking at, oh, wait a minute. Now it says it's right over no, wait a minute. It's right over. I had no signal at all. It was just making yeah. things up because there was so much rain. It was yeah. physically blocking the connection to the satellite signal. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, gotten there's, better, there's, but it's still, yeah. those kind of things still happen, right? Oh, gosh, yes. Gosh, yeah. yes. And, and the thing with with our Pathfinder unit is it uses two two different forms of satellite to find your position, uh, the dog is uh, where it identifies the location of the dog is off of true satellite, uh, comes off the satellite, comes to the dog collar, comes back to the connecting device, comes up to your phone app. Yeah. On When when it finds you, your GPS location, it actually is coming off a satellite going to a cellular telephone tower. So we're using the cellular telephone uh, GPS. So it's two different. Many times people say, well, geez, my unit connect right away. Uh to, and found me but it took a while for it to find the dog yeah because it's two different forms that's why yeah and it's not just one satellite signal i think it's it's multiple it, satellites it, you are correct it uh it like cross references yes yeah yeah well mm-hmm. we could go on all day on that i used to teach gps back in the day and uh, the misconceptions there oh you could write a book about that stuff but you're not going to hear about that here on the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden the host that's pete fisher with dog Tra- we're going to talk more about uh bird dogs bird hunting dog training that sort of thing in just a couple minutes pete put your feet up and relax for a minute i'm going to make a couple commercial announcements and stick around for more of pete fisher and also your two cents worth from the social media pages on uh uh you know are you using a new shotgun this year just curious and uh you'll be interested in the responses coming up right after this first from sage and you know Always free shipping on all of the gun care items there, whether it's a case, a cleaning mat, some of the chemicals, the tools out there. I'm still a big believer in CLP. It's my favorite way to take care of my gun at the end of every shooting session, whether it's one measly valley quail after a long walk or a session at the range with our friends from Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, always taking care of your guns, sage and breaker.com sign up for the mailing list you won't miss the occasional sales you'll get first notice of new products as well at sage and breaker.com and if you're looking for a new kennel for your dog getting ready to travel this year or just taking them around town roughlandkennels.com you know more dogs ride in a roughland kennel than any other performance kennel there's a reason for it designed by hardcore bird hunters who travel a lot i know because i'm traveling to visit with allison and doug this season learn more about their products from great performance crates to all the accessories for carrying water gear attachments i just hooked up my fan all sorts of great stuff at roughlandkennels.com and yes I think Flick was in on the naming of their website. Ruff is spelled R-U-F-F, rufflandkennels.com.
And by now, Pete has had his uh, coffee, and he's ready to come back in. Pete Fisher of Dogtra, welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Thanks for having me. So um, if you had to narrow it down to a particular dog breed, I know you're a retriever guy from way back, but uh, since, uh, you know, since you've gotten around a bit and put a few miles under your um, boots, what's your favorite dog breed these days? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a retriever guy, probably always will be, uh, but quite honestly, Scott, I like any dog that works good, yeah. minds well. Yeah. Um, is is a, a value to have in the field and not a detriment to the hunt, so to speak. <laughs> um, I, I've I've been a Labrador guy. I made my living off training Labradors and breeding them, and uh, for gun dog work and also some hunt tests and field trials. But I've I've had most of my adult life. I've had a German Shorthair Pointer, and I still have one. Trip is his name, and he's uh, gosh, Trip is eleven and still going strong. I'm gonna hunt him some this year yet, and. Um, but I, I, I like any dog, uh, to answer your question, but especially I like a, a well-trained dog. And one that's, uh, like I said, I mean, you, you've been there, I've been there, every, everybody that's uh, going to listen to this has been there where you've been along and, and, uh, uh, on a hunt and, and somebody's dog just is unmanageable, out of control, and ruins the hunt. And, um, and, and those dogs, you can't blame it on the dog. You got to blame no. it on the owner because there's a lack of training and there's a lack of effort. And you know, it's it's all done in steps. And so we start. I start my dogs very young. I obviously use a remote training collar on them. And but you got to lay down a foundation. You just don't take and throw the remote training collar on the dog. And as my old buddy Pat Nolan would say, start pumping them around. You know, there's, yeah, yeah. there's the remote training collars used to reinforce commands the dog already knows. So until that dog's been trained and knows its obedience commands, it isn't fair to take the remote training collar and reinforce those commands. And really, it's it's if you ever saw a, a good trainer who knows how to use a remote training collar in a in a full program, that dog knows how to turn off stimulation three ways: come to me, go stationary, and go away from me. Then, when that is done, we call that e-collar condition. Now we build all of our training off of that and all of our control work. Do you um, advocate um, having a dog wear a, whether it's just one that's not turned on or a real dummy collar? Do they? Is that part of the conditioning process for you? Um, norm, you know, it used to be back many, many years ago when e-collars first came out. Almost every manufacturer included a dummy collar with yeah. it. Yeah, And the idea was to put the collar on the dog and, and get him used to the weight and feel of it. And quite honestly, uh, over the course of time, many trainers uh, figured out that that really isn't necessary. Yeah, That obedience training to start with, that, that leash training, so the dog knows the commands very well, is much more important to do that foundation work than having the dog run around with a, with a box on its neck for a week or two. So the the dog that is already solid on its obedience training, the day that when I train a dog, the day that that dog gets outfitted with a remote training collar, the first day he wears it is he's going to feel the stimulation. Yeah. I'm not going to be messing around with any dummy collars. Yeah. And if it's all done right, we don't need, and so hardly any, I don't think there's any company includes them anymore as a cost saving, but also uh, most of them weren't getting used uh, sure. because it's like everything else we've done. Uh, we, Trainers have evolved just like every other uh, uh, industry in, in this country, and trainers have gotten way better with the use of the remote training collar and how to use it and the programs that, they've, that have evolved with it. So back in the day, the, it was just a negative reinforcement, just a punishment tool. Yeah, all yeah. the, the only way, and, there, and it was high levels of stimulation, and that isn't the case anymore. We've got variable stimulation Every every dog temperament can be trained with a remote training collar, an e collar, whatever you want to call it. But back in the day when these things first came out, they only had one level, and uh, and they they were hot. And oh, so I know. I I was there. The case <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All of us were that yeah. uh, that were back in the day. Yes. Well, yeah. Okay. Here here's the question I've never heard asked, but um, 
But you can enlighten us. All right, we we understand the training collar. It's a black box in most cases, and there's two prongs coming in out of that thing, and they need to touch the dog's skin, basically. But where mm-hmm. on the dog's neck? Help me put that in the correct position for the most uh, effective use of a of an e-collar. Sure, that's a great great question. And most manufacturers are going to have a video or photos or something on their website that's going to show the appropriate place. Most of us have figured out the best put place to put the receiver box is going to be off to the side of the dog's windpipe, high on the dog's neck, almost underneath the ear, so to speak, Scott. Yeah. And 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 so a, a, it's not appropriate to put it over the uh, the, the windpipe for, yeah. for an obvious reason in case the dog would, um, you know, get Ew. bumped Ew. up against something. You don't even yeah. talk about it. Yes. Yeah, so Ugh. we put it up high. The other thing that we need to talk about is dogs can get sores. Um, yeah. Something that we refer to as uh, pressure necrosis underneath the, the, the contact points. And unfortunately, many individuals and veterinarians, when they see this, they say, well, it burnt the dog. Yeah. And believe me, <clears throat> the the remote training collar does not produce enough electrical current to burn tissue okay it just doesn't it's not designed that way uh i had a woman uh that we were having trouble with with her dog got sores on the underneath it and it was pressure necrosis uh is what it was left on the dog too long too tight didn't move it around what it does is it collapses the blood vessels in the tissue Uh, and when those blood vessels are collapsed there's no blood flow and so it creates a couple ulcers if you leave it unchecked it turns into a secondary infection and she said, well, my, my veterinarian uh, said that they're third-degree burns. And I said, it's, it's not possible. And I'm going to tell you what you can do to verify that. You can take your training collar off, put it on the highest level you can, and put it on a piece of raw chicken. And you push that button as long as you want. All night long, you call me back tomorrow morning, and you let me know if you were able to cook any of the chicken. She thought I was joking. But quite honestly, there's no way that the remote training collar produces enough energy or it can't produce heat. It works basically on a, on a similar uh, elect, electrical stimulation as static electricity. There's yeah. no heat involved with it. There's right. no, it just can't. But pressure necrosis sores are very real. So the reason we put, the other reason we put the unit off to one side of the dog's neck, let's say you and I are out hunting and we've been out all day long. Maybe our dogs got wet and we're going to get some moist dermatitis underneath those contacts. Mm. Now the next day we see some irritation there. We can go to the other side of the neck with the, with the, with the receiver box and, and not be keep irritating that same side. I love so it. So off, off to the side and up fairly high is where we put them. Okay. Which begs two more questions. The first one is not a question actually. It's, you know, uh, that pressure ne- necrosis reminds me a lot of what we used to call saddle sores on horses. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. basically the same idea. Um, second, mm-hmm. um, all right. So um, on a GPS collar, <clears throat> the the part the black box we, we mm-hmm. call that the we call that the receiver, right? Uh, the one that's on the collar is whatever that black box is called. Is there a front and a back? In other words, uh, does it matter which way we face that thing on a dog? Well, the, the main thing on a GPS unit is you're going to want to have your antennas facing upwards, both yeah. the GPS and your MERS band antenna. You don't want to strap them down. I know it's tempting. Uh, if, if you want really long range out of these units, let's say you're a coon hunter, yeah. and your dog, you're kicking off some hounds that are going to be three, four miles away. You want that whip antenna to be straight up in the air, that long-range sure, antenna. Yeah. For you and I uh, that are going to be upland hunting, and my German short hair stays within 50 to 80 yards of me almost all the time, I, I could take my GPS, I could take my long whip antenna and zip tie it down if I wanted to. Because sure. my dog's not going to be out at that great distance. But any of those antennas uh, that you're talking about, your GPS and your MERS band antenna, you want to keep those up up high. Uh-huh. Yeah, I get it. Um for 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 all the obvious reasons, one's trying to find satellites 200 miles up, mm-hmm. another is trying to get the signal high enough so that the hummock between you and your dog doesn't block the signal. Right. Correct. Great. So so in the field, what is the what what is the biggest mistake a hunter makes with their um, their training collar? 
I would say the the biggest mistake is not conditioning the dog to the uh-huh. to the stimulation uh, in a in a controlled environment in what we we always called yard training. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And and you know I I would do a lot of uh, dog training uh, clinics for like Pheasants Forever Youth Days, and I'd get a hundred kids at these things. And one of the things that I like doing is I was doing the demonstration and talking about the groundwork that we lay for our, our dogs before we take them hunting. And, and I, would always, I would always pick a youngster out of the crowd, and I would say, so you play youth baseball? And, and little Joey might say, well, yeah. And I said, so when you play youth baseball, when you played your first youth, youth baseball game, did you just go and start playing a game or did your, your mom and dad take you to practice? And he said, well, of course I go to practice. Well, that's the same thing with a dog. You know, we got to practice. We've got to train the dog. So he understands the out of the, the static before we take him in the field. And I would always say, well, you know, if you took little Joey to his first baseball game and he never went to practice and he accidentally got a hit, he wouldn't know to run to first base, the pitcher's mound, or back to the to the car. So it's really critical that we do the the training, and and we do the the remote collar training, the conditioning that I mentioned earlier, at home and not in the field. And but what does happen is that you know uh, an individual will go out with his dog, and and the dog's out of control. He gets into some pheasants, and we all know pheasants love to run. Dog figures out that he can chase the pheasant to the end of the field. There goes the dog, there goes the bird, and he doesn't get a shot. So the next uh, day, uh, the hunter walks into the, to the sporting goods store, and he picks himself up a brand-new remote training collar, and he says, here, we're going to solve our problems, and we are now going to level the playing field because old six-pack, next time he gets on a, on a bird, uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach him, okay? What happens, Scott, is re- – the use of the remote training collar is basically avoidance training. The dog learns to comply with a command by, by avoiding that uncomfortable feeling of the remote training collar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if we take him out in the field, he's never been conditioned. He doesn't know the out is what we call it. Mm. And now he starts chasing that pheasant immediately. The hunter grabs his transmitter, starts applying stimulation to the dog. The dog is running under excitement. He probably is ignoring the low levels, the medium levels, maybe even the high levels, but pretty soon it registers. And all at once the dog gives out a hell of a yelp because he's been hit with a fairly high level of stimulation. The bird keeps going. The dog stands there and looks back at the owner. He might be 100 yards away, way out of gun range. And so now a couple things are going to happen. The dog might come back to you or he might run the other way. Because he's going to try and avoid that situation. And so what happens is, is now the dog's taken off. Now the guy sees his couple hundred dollar remote training collar, his dog that he had out in the field that day, and all of them are taken off. He throws the transmitter down. He says, there, I knew these things weren't any good. The problem is, is he never went through the conditioning process. Yeah. He never took that dog to practice, just like little Joey never went to practice and and got put in his first game. There's right ways to do everything in this world, and the use of a remote training collar, it's really important that you lay that foundation work. You know, it, it, once again, you know, you know who needs more training? The trainer. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. let the, good, and thank you. And everybody um, can learn from that example. It's so true. You know, the other thing I, I, I use a, a, a collar for, and, and, you know, luckily, Lots of guys now are using some of the other aspects of a training collar, uh, the vibration, for example, or the, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what do we call it? Um, Not the beeper part, but people are using the beeper for other things as well. But the, uh, you know, the The known, yeah, uh, whatever. Uh, So, but I use, I use a collar with a lot of dogs as, as a, a, an interruption of, what I think is the conspiracy to dis- disobey uh, using your uh, dog chasing a pheasant out of range is a good example. You know, at some point you, we hope you learn 
your dog well enough to know, okay, I think he's probably, the next thing he's going to do is this. He's got tells, just like a bad poker player. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and if you can get in on that, you can interrupt what is going to be the next wrong thing. You ever use mm-hmm. it, pre- uh, I guess you'd call it pre- preemptively. Sure. Sure, and you can use almost all the Dogtra products come with a pager vibration on pager, it. Pager, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's a strong vibration. Yeah. And and you can use that. Let's say I'm sitting in a duck blind and my dog starts getting antsy as some birds are coming into the decoys, and I might just reach over and just tap the pager, and I might hiss at him for sit yeah. uh, with, and just reinforce with, with a little bit of pager. Mm-hmm. If he gets up and starts moving, I'm probably going to use stimulation and get him get his butt back down. Yeah. But you got to realize that, you know, there's so many times that people don't, you got to think like a dog. And, oh, yeah. you know, the, you know, and the dog isn't out there to ruin your hunt. You know, the dog didn't sit there as, as the pheasant was uh, taking off down the field, down the corn row, or the de- mallards were coming in over the decoys. He wasn't sitting there and looking at the owner saying, you know, I'm really going to mess this up for him today. The dog, the dog is just, dogs are not terribly bright animals to start with. They just act and react instinctively. Retrievers want to retrieve, okay? So he sees birds coming in. He wants to get up and take off after them. As a trainer, we want to train him to sit and stay and wait until the gun goes off. All is clear. Then we stand up and step in and send him off and retrieve And because we don't want him busting out into the decoys while there's birds in the air uh, for a lot of different reasons, but safety being one of them. But the dog dogs uh, are excitable, and they get running under... Um, dogs can release uh, this natural hormone that's called cortisol. And when a dog is in that mode, that's where that pager vibration is not going to uh, affect them. Yeah. The, your whistle is not going to affect them. That's where you're going to have to lean on them with a remote training collar to get them back under control. And But it makes it that much easier if, you, if you've done all this practice work that I just explained earlier mm-hmm. and set up as much of this training at home and in your yard or in, in a v- training venue somewhere so you can replicate what you think your dog's going to uh, experience out in the field so that you know, how to, you know how to handle it when it does happen. And so that's really a, a big part, in my opinion, of, of working with a dog is that you got to understand what he's doing is not, he's not doing it to screw up your yeah. hunt. Yeah. It's his in, it's his instincts kicking in. Well, you you hit on something, and, and and so you know how to handle it, but the dog needs to know how to handle it as well. So, you know, yep. despite what Delmar Smith tells us about never giving a dog a chance to fail, you do have to set him up to um, be tempted to fail at whatever you're teaching, so that he understands the right way and the wrong way. Don't you? Oh, ex- exactly. Uh, I mean, in, in, a, in a perfect world, yeah, <laughs> that, that would that would happen. But let's face it, um, that that doesn't happen uh, very often. No. So yeah, I mean, that's that's what that's what life is all about. I mean, it, it's positive and negative reinforcement for the for the dog, and there are going to be uh, times when you have them on the field where just plain and simple, you're going to have to correct the dog. Oh yeah. It just it's just yeah. Um, I, I, you know this this whole shtick that I hear of of people out there that say you know we raise uh, my favorite one is uh, British Labs you know you oh, get yeah. a good British Lab you don't need a you don't need a remote training call <laughs> no no there's a, we, it's total <laughs> what do they call it po- positive training yeah, yeah. we never yeah. do any we never yeah. even raise our voice yeah. to the dog yeah you can yeah, put yeah, a sure. marble in a yeah. marble in a pop can and that's all you're gonna have to yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah oh yeah, boy. Let's come, but you know the other thing is, is is everybody's aspiration is different as well of what True. they expect out of their dogs. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, maybe some of those dogs, those great fireside companions, are just that. Um, but you are probably like like Pete Fisher, Scott, and that you want a dog that has got a lot of drive out in the field. Even at my age, I still want a dog that has a lot of drive and and uh, is a fun dog to work with. I don't. That's the kind of dog. I all my dogs are American bred field trial Labradors, and yeah, and. Uh, I, I swear by them. They are, I, they just, they are fun to hunt with, and they just don't want to quit. I, I swear at them once in a while too, but I understand exactly what you're talking about. Tell me about your Definitely. your your favorite hunt from the last couple of years. Oh, one of my favorite hunts, and I've told this story on a couple of podcasts. So anybody that might have heard some of my other uh, podcast interviews have heard this story before. But I was out in North Dakota, and I had a couple uh, 
buddies with me and my uh, my buddy Dave Brew, who was the Yukonuba rep- representative, was with me and Dave is now gone. And my buddy Greg Ruby was with me and Greg's been a, a, a probably my best friend for a lot of years. And we uh, we were hunting out in North Dakota and we wingtipped a greenhead mallard and it sailed and sailed. And you've been in North Dakota and you know how flat the ground is out there. Yeah. And I had my, my dog Rex with me and Rex was an AKC master hunter and he was in the hut and I watched this bird sail down a solid 250 yards and kind of crumpled out and it was a windy day. It was kind of misting and and as we were wrapping up, I looked over my shoulder off to the gravel road and I could see this pickup truck watching us and um, we had a hunch it was the local conservation officer and it was <laughs> and he pulled out and he parked into our spread we were picking up and we, he checked everything, the, the plugs and the birds and the, everything. And and so uh, I stepped out of the spread and I lined Rex up and sent him off. And I could hear the game warden talking to my my uh, buddy Greg. And he said, what's this guy doing? And he said, well, we shot a bird earlier. And that bird's laying out there about 250 yards away. And he said, what is he going to do? And he said, you just watch. And so I lined Rex up and we did, I did a long blind retrieve with him and off across the stubble field he went and a handful of whistles you know stop and cast back and here he was about 250 yards out and he picked up the green head and came trotting in with it and the game warden was standing there and he looked at my buddy Greg and he said he's like having a, a, a guided missile to find your birds isn't he <laughs> and, and Greg just just laughed and and uh and the game warden came over and chatted with me and he said that's amazing what what you've got there and I said well, I put a lot of work into them and told them what I did for a living. So that that's one of my favorite stories. I've told it before. I love it. And you're not alone. I, I remember writing a series for Outdoor Life magazine a few years back. And of all the dog owners I talked to, it was the retriever guys who got the most satisfaction out of whatever their dog was doing at the time. And interestingly, yep. while we call this the Upland Nation podcast, and most of us are hunting almost strictly dry ground most of the time except for that one hunt in south dakota in november you know um but but a lot of us are using a labrador uh so if you were going to give every labrador owner who hunts the uplands one bit of advice about how to handle train or do something for the upland side of their uh hunting season what what advice would you give them pete you know when i when i had the training kennel scott one of the things that I would see on a regular basis was dogs would come in and they weren't in good shape. Yeah. And many times that fit just fine because the owners weren't in very good shape either. But the, uh, you got to get your dog in shape. You got to get them uh, road ready. You got to get his pads toughened up. You got to get them thinned down. You, that's just really important. So you don't take this dog out. You know how hot it can be. Even in, for someone like me in Minnesota, mm-hmm. we can get some awfully warm weather early in the season, pheasant hunting, or if you do any kind of preserve hunting, you know, those, the, the licensed shooting preserves open up. Uh, some of them are probably going to open up here in August already. And if your dog's not in good shape, uh, you, you can, you can hurt them. Uh, so besides doing the control work, which I think every dog needs, regardless of what you're doing with them, uh, conditioning the dog Great. and yourself, I think is really important. Well, and on that note, if you haven't heard it yet, we got thunder and lightning bearing down on me as we speak. So I'm going to disconnect everything in here, including you, Pete Fisher of Dogtra. Thanks. Uh, We'll do this again, and and I will see you in Minneapolis as well. Thanks again. If you want more information on what Pete's talking about, go to Dogtra. Dot com. Pete Fisher, Senior Consultant for Dogtra. A wealth of information, and there's my cue. I'm out of here, man. Thanks okay. again, Pete. Thank you. Don't go away quite yet. We've got a few more things to cover, including your two cents worth from the social media pages. Let's see. Let's see. This week we're uh, talking about our new shotgun. Are we shooting one this year or not? Stick around for that after a word from LegacySports.com slash pointer. Yeah, I took a good long look recently at their Lux, that's L-U-X, Lux model, field gun in over and under 
Nice. Turkish grade 2 walnut stock and fore end. A fiber optic sight on the end. Barrel selectors, chrome line barrels, five choke tubes included. Very nice trigger feel. Beautiful looking fit and finish. And then to top it all off, that white receiver with raised gold finished mallards engraved and, um, what do I call that? Gilded onto the finish itself. They pop right out there. It's a, just kind of a touch of elegance. That's in the looks model. If you want to learn more about all the pointer shotguns, go to LegacySports.com slash pointer. And if you're taking a new gun or an old gun or your new shotgun that you're just thinking about uh, as part of the plan for this year, you might consider the Burt County Bird Bounty. It benefits camo, canine adoption and mentoring outdoors. That's my friends at Pheasant Bonanza. Better hurry up, though. The deadline to sign up is October 1st. The event is in November. It's a full weekend of hunting, upland and waterfowl shooting, clays, social events, and lodging. It's all included. Learn more at K-A-M-O-I-N-C dot org. Yeah, so I asked on uh, the social media pages, um, hey, man, you're going to use a new shotgun this year? And, and, you know, a goodly number of you said yes. In fact, uh, Ralph Daddario says, yeah, I need something lighter to carry in the field. Rashawn Gordon, you're just ba- bragging, aren't you? Got a new 20-gauge uh, like the one in my picture, so he's got a a pointer hey good for you please tell them about it tell them i sent you uh, but then he also shows off in a photo his 28 gauge fab arm hey someday we will get connected Rashawn, and you can use that one and i'll use my 28 um, mitch prow says are you offering a new one if so i certainly will use a new shotgun sue book out this is great and i love this kind of stuff yes i'm the keeper of my dad's guns which is fantastic dan lenson says only if i win the lottery first (laughs) uh robert murphy hey you it's never too late he says i'm going to use an old 16 gauge single shot and a double barrel 12 gauge not enough hunting years left to justify a new gun yeah well you know if it ain't broke don't fix it (laughs) <laughs> Ryan Chase, uh, the wife said, I got one last year, so it's a hard no for this year. Don Ketty, we're all drooling. I added, He says, I added a 1910 Parker VH 20 gauge to the lineup. Hasn't even fired it yet. Couldn't get shells for the first six months he owned it. Well, we can relate to that. And then Richard Schrema, I am jealous. He found a let's see ruger red label 20 gauge say that three times fast ruger red label 20 gauge christmas present from his wife and we all feel for you josh moore he has a bad gun hoarding problem there's no 12-step program for that and scott laplante has the right answer how can that be a bad problem Yeah, keep up the good work, everybody. Sure appreciate talking with you on social media as well. 71 replies to that question. That one was a hot topic. Oh, okay, Lance. All right, you're showing off not a new shotgun, that new puppy. Couldn't resist. Is there anything cuter than a Weimariner puppy? The ears are longer than their legs at one point in life. Good dog, Z. Good dog. Yeah, we're brought to you in part by TrueLockChokes.com. TrueLockChokes.com. They have all sorts of resources there of all types. Whether you're learning how to pattern a gun or you're looking for the right choke tube for your gun, the simplest thing you can do to help your shooting is replace your choke tubes. Get some well-engineered, well-manufactured choke tubes you'll minimize the holes in your pattern and that will minimize missed birds. Learn more at truelockchokes.com. 
Well, thank you, Pete Fisher, for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. We appreciate your insights and all the knowledge you are willing to share with others. To all of you who comment at our social media platforms, especially those of you who left ratings or reviews, you deserve an extra bit of kibble tonight. We're all made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Jokes. Please take a look at my page, FurFeathersFriends.com, and find out how to take a friend hunting. Hope I'll see you in Huron for that, or I hear about where you're taking somebody new. Until then, I'll see you on the range. I'm Scott Linton. Thanks for listening.